Okay, all right, I think we're ready to get started. Thank you so much everyone for your patience. Um, my name is Jill Rumley and I am the president of the Longmont Artists Guild. Welcome to our January meeting tonight. I'm so glad you all could make it. Um, a couple of announcements, um, our upcoming member meetings. In February, we're gonna have a demo of mixed media collage by Eulalia, I think it's mm -hmm. Mejia, Mejia or Meha. Um, she's actually from Columbia, South America, and she's gonna be Zooming in in February. Um, and we will be um, sending out more information about that shortly. For our March meeting, it's gonna be in person again, and it will be at the Firehouse Art Center. And Lisa Larson, our treasurer, will be giving a talk about art licensing. Uh, hope to maybe stream that one on Zoom. Uh, we'll see if we can get that situated. Uh, we're currently um, finalizing our details for the April meeting, which will also be in person at the Firehouse. Um, and in May, um, we're holding our meeting on the fourth Wednesday instead of the second. And that will be our annual art supply swap and the state of the guild report where we just kind of talk about our year, our budget, our goals, the future and all sorts of things like that. Uh, I also do wanna add that the February meeting is going to be held on Thursday the 15th and not Wednesday the 14th for obvious reasons. Um, and coming up, we have our 2024 member art show and sale. Uh, the show is gonna be at the Great Frame Up and it is from March 8th through April 6th. $25 entry fee, you must be a current member. You'll be allowed to enter two art pieces um, no longer than 36 inches on the longest side. 60% commission to the artist um, when your artwork sells. We have finalized our judge, Nancy Wiley. She is a painter, watercolorist, pastelist, and oil painter. Uh, we will also be holding an open reception with awards, um, ribbons, and cash prizes. And uh, that will be the first Friday that we're open, which is Friday, March 8th from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, registration is going to open January 20th and you will get some emails about that. So keep um, an eye out for that. Okay, now we're going to finally get started with our um, art demo. And uh, Chuck has graciously um, offered to give us an oil painting demo this evening. Chuck studied painting and sculpture at the University of Notre Dame and studied painting with Henry Henshi, the well-known painter and teacher at the Cape School in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Chuck has been a longtime instructor at the Denver Art Museum and the Art Student League of Denver. He also holds ongoing classes in his gallery and studio in Lafayette. His work can be found in public and private collections throughout the U.S. and Europe. Chuck says, I have been fascinated with painting from the actual experience of sight as opposed to painting from a set of rules or theories as taught to many artists. Using the principles of seeing that I learned from Henshi, I continue to discover a fresh vision of the world as simply as an arrangement of colored shapes. Science has verified that color vision is a much more complex and fascinating phenomenon than any theory can ever predict. For me, painting is an ongoing contemplation on the mystery and magic of life. All right, let's get this show on the road. All right, let me pin, I need to unpin me. And I am going to pin Chuck. All right, there you are. Um, and then we will move it to your easel when you are ready. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you can hear me? Yes. Yes. And let me go ahead and pin this one. There we go. Great. All right. So, uh, and you can all see that. Is it a pretty good good enough size? Yes. And if anyone has questions, everything. yep. If you have questions, you can put them in the chat and I will relay them to to Chuck, and if you have any concerns or anything going on that, you know, just go ahead and throw it into the chat and I will see it. Okay, I made it a little too big, hold on. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, do we have the whole canvas in? Okay, we're good. Okay, <laughs> apologize. I apologize for this whole mishap, but uh, we're good now. And I'll paint even faster than I was planning. Um, so this is the scene I'm going to do. It's a, it's in Santa Barbara, California, <clears throat> where I have been painting uh, for the last couple of years, and it's just been very inspiring for me. And uh, um, uh, actually, this is a little bit south of Santa Barbara. I can't remember the town, but uh, that area, and. Uh, so how I, when I approach a painting, uh, I go by how it's organized, the scene, uh, by the light. So I'm looking at areas where the sun's hitting directly and then where it's in shade and uh, looking at establishing those masses. Okay, so that's what I'm going to start with. And uh, so I'll try to talk while I'm painting and feel free to ask questions as I go. And uh, here we go. I'm painting with a knife painting knife, um, which I use almost exclusively lately. I, I tend to fluctuate between knives and brushes, but lately I've been just really loving the knife in a new way. So that's what we're attempting here. So I'm establishing, just establishing right now, these little light planes um, there, and let's see in the tree. I'm not trying to get the color exact yet, just uh, trying to get a general sense of it. So really just, just working right now to establish the masses, the areas of direct light and then the areas that we think of as shade planes.
I think I'll be able to talk more as I get a little further into it. Right now, I'm really trying to quickly get something started. Hi, Chuck. We have a question. Um, okay. Someone wants to know if you're working on a canvas or what is your yes. substrate? Canvas. Is it a, a stretch canvas or is it a canvas board? Board. Board. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. I usually work on. Uh, <clears throat> Masonite, um, especially when I'm working with knife, it's it just a gessoed masonite really takes the knife well. And uh, sometimes canvas is a little harder to work with uh, with this approach with the knife because of the texture of it. And uh, this canvas has a little more texture than I prefer, but uh, you know we're making do here. So we have another question um, comment mm -hmm. from Chris from Crystal. Um, mm -hmm. She's curious. She's always been taught to layer up, not not to fat. <laughs> um, I, I'm assuming she's referring to palette knife. Um, the how you're applying a very thick texture to the canvas rather than a thinner base layer. Um, yes. He said that she said that you did not mention thinning anything down or using gamsol or other thinners to lay in I your ground. No, I'm just painting uh, direct thick paint. And um, she also says she's curious to know if you have ever painted using thin to fat layering technique or if you've always just gone with this current technique. Uh, I've never really, I've always painted uh, without medium, I, you know, thinning the paint. I've always preferred the the body you know the weight of the paint the thickness of the paint and so um even when i'm painting with brushes i uh i still use no thinner And uh, you know, I I guess uh, I've always been a little bit of a rebel. And uh, as soon as somebody starts telling me rules, uh, I want to understand why I should follow that rule. And so I'll play with it, and then I'll uh, over the years try to break the rule and see what I discover. And uh, so what I've discovered is just what I'm sharing here of how I much prefer the uh, 
thickness of the paint. Your comment got a lot of smiles. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all what like being rebels. All the being a rebel, yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Well, that's the whole, you know, the, what I, why I was attracted to Henshi so much was uh, he, he was a rule breaker also. And, um, but at the same time, he kind of, and he never never made a rule, but he made suggestions on how to use our eyes in order to see. Like when I first started, um, when I first saw Henry's work, and by the way, he's probably the, the most influential painter. Uh, I've studied with quite a few different painters, but he was the most, I would say, influential. I, when I first saw his work, I couldn't understand how he was able to get the, uh, there was so much luminosity in his work. So just the paintings, I literally, the first time I saw one of his paintings, I literally looked behind it. I thought there was some kind of light behind the painting. Turns out there wasn't. And I found that intriguing. Like, how did he do that? So I went and watched him. He he taught in uh, Provincetown, had a school there, and uh, that was started actually by his teacher Charles Hawthorne. And and uh, so I went to his school, and I watched him do a demonstration. Every Friday morning, he would do a demonstration. And uh, I was a little bit um, thinking it was a, a scam. I'm watching. He had a still life set up in the sun outside. And uh, he was painting it. And I'm watching. And he's putting in all these colors. And I'm thinking, this guy's making this stuff up. I'm looking at the subject, and I'm not seeing the colors he's claiming to be seeing. And I was a little turned off by it, and I thought it was a scam. Uh, this was back in the um, when was that? In the early '80s. I found, and, uh, his, uh, I found his website, and I put uh -huh. that in the chat, also with a sample of um, one of his paintings that you're talking about, and it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, when I, when I saw his work in person, I, it just, I, I honestly I cried. I had never seen anything so luminous. And I couldn't even understand how is it possible? That's a painting? How is that possible? You know, how is it possible to actually put light in a painting? It, I mean, at the time, that's what I thought he was doing somehow, actually literally putting the light in. But what he was doing was using color to, you know, the, what Monet discovered was that what we think of as light is a, is a relationship of colored shapes next to each other. And, uh, and so, um, So what he was doing was observing um, color relationships. And you'd think, well, what's so hard about seeing a color? I'm looking at what he's doing, and I'm thinking, that's not the color I see. That's why I thought he was making it up. And uh, 
I decided I didn't want to study with him because I thought it was a scam and he's claiming something and then yet I couldn't figure out how that could be possible. I couldn't see it. And uh, being younger and naive and all that, I decided he was running a scam and I wasn't going to fall for it. And uh, I told a friend of mine, artist friend of mine, about him. And uh, she was also a landscape painter and, and uh, I uh, told her about him and, you know, in one of our conversations. And then about a year later, I saw her work at a show and uh, I was blown away by it. And I said, wow, you know, where did you, you've really changed. Your work is amazing, luminous. And, and she said, I studied with Henry. And then I realized, okay, I got to go study with this guy and figure out there, everybody who studies with him claims they're seeing these colors. So, all right, I'll try it. And I was fortunate I got to spend a month with him one-on-one. -on -one. He had just had a cataract surgery and he couldn't paint. He was about 86 at that point. This was back in mid-80s. And uh, So in that month, he changed my life, but it took, it's taken me years to even understand what he was teaching me. It's taken years to really under, to, to develop my vision uh, to where I was um, then starting to see color in a very unexpected way, very unexpected way. And by that, I mean unexpected colors. Like I started seeing all kinds of pink in a blue sky. I started seeing violets and blues and purples in the shadow planes of trees. And I started seeing uh, all these colors. And uh, quite a surprise. So we have another question. Okay. Uh, Desiree asked, um, are you mixing the colors quickly on your palette before placing or is the mixing happening when you're applying it, as you're applying it to the canvas? It's happening mostly on the canvas and a little bit. I, you know, I'm taking, um, I'm sorry, I can't just show you my palette right now. I'll show you after. Uh, so I'm doing a little bit of mixing on the canvas and then um, and then a lot of it, most of it I'm mixing on the canvas on the on the board. So that's the initial lay in. Uh, establishing the masses, and now I just stepped back for the first time, which was a little late to be doing that, and noticing that, well, my shadow planes aren't dark enough over here. So then I'm just mixing more color into them. And we have another question um, from mm -hmm. Andrea. She would like to know what Hi, brand Andrea. of paint. <laughs> she would like to know what brand of paint you use. It's um, some of it is Gamblin, and some of it is uh, Holbein. 
I used to paint exclusively with Holbein, but then as I started getting thicker and thicker with my paint, uh, that was getting more and more expensive. So I've switched now to Gamblin, which is a surprisingly decent brand. And it's, you know, quite a bit less expensive than some of the major ones. I mean, like Holbein and uh, what are other good paints? I can't think right now. But it's fun. I, why I think I'm loving the knife is that it's made the experience a lot more abstract to me. I don't think anymore about what I'm painting, like trees and a hill and grasses and um, you know whatever the subject is. I don't think in those terms anymore. I'm just totally thinking in terms of abstract. What are the shapes I see and what colors are they? And just trusting that vision and developing that vision. So some of the other paint paints that I'm kind of familiar with, um, mm -hmm. Richeson, Sennelier, Schmanke, Rembrandt, Rimbacher, Old Holland. Yeah, Old Holland is one of the best. I use some of their colors. Um, so yeah, Old Holland and, and what's that other one? The super expensive one. Um, um, Richeson, is that one? No, no. Uh, what is that? Sennelier. No. Their pastels are expensive. <laughs> yeah. Sennelier makes good paints. Yeah. Um, I can't think right now. Yeah, I was just kind of scanning dickblick.com <laughs> to see what the prices uh -huh. are. Um, I mean, Schminky is kind of expensive, but. Yeah, Schminky and uh, Old Holland, and there's there, those are some of the more expensive ones. Um, Someone said, oh, Jan said, Verisai, B, B is in Victor, A-R-A-S-I. It's huh. Vasari. Vasari, thank you. <laughs> Terrible. Oh, Vasari, yes, yeah, those are, I've I'm never not used sure that's spelled right, but. <laughs> <laughs> So from that angle, we can't quite see you painting. It's uh, focusing on your shoulder. <laughs> oh, am I too too much in front of it? Yeah. <laughs> that better? I know. It's hard to, it's so hard to. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry. That's okay. You're into it. You That's awesome. We're here for a second. But now I'm not in the way? You're good now. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh.
So how we have to how what time? Um, gosh, I mean, we can go for a while. Um, six. I mean, we could easily go for another forty-five minutes. Okay. Seven thirty. You know, whatever whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Good. Okay. I want to try to develop it enough so it makes sense. Yeah. No, I can. I see it coming together. <laughs> uh huh. Good. The thing I learned from Henry was how to use the eyes in a different way. And it's amazing how that facilitates color perception. Um, and, and how he taught to use the eyes was uh, by focusing on your full field of vision, not just where your eyes are pointing, but by, um, you know, kind of using more of the peripheral vision, we uh, can look at different areas simultaneously. And it turns out that color perception, uh, it, we only see color in relation to other color, how a color appears to our eye is really dependent on what colors are around it. So that's the same color we've, I mean, you've probably all learned this or seen those optical illusions where it's something looks like a shadow plane and it turns out when you look at it next to another aspect of the photo, it turns out to be a light plane. Uh, you know, it's a lighter color. So how, color appears to our eye is is uh, a bit elusive. Um, what I really love about the knife also is uh, I, I've found a, uh, a love of a bit more wildness, I guess, trying to get more of a sense of abandon in it, in my work, a sense of um, just like I'm, I want them to happen all at once. And uh, you know, sometimes I work them, like I work, I, I never used to work from a photograph and I rarely do now. Um, uh, boy, I'm rambling, aren't I? Oh, that's okay. We have another question for you. Um, oh, good, shoot. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> thank you, Crystal, coming to the rescue. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, um, thank you. No, I, your rambling's great. Um, she want, would like to know if you work an entire painting wet to completion, or do you find that you let your first interaction with the canvas dry and then build upon that? No, I tend to work it all wet into wet. Um, except, you know, I, I will at times bring a painting into the studio and, you know, often you get something that works great outside in all that light, you know, it's so much more intense to light. So that indoors, it, it kind of loses. And so I make adjustments to compensate for that in the studio. So yeah, I do try to do it all in one kind of explosion. Um, you know, I uh, I think of it now, I, I play piano, 
And piano has really begun to influence my painting uh, in that when I play piano, all I really have been interested in is imp improvisation. I just make up stuff as I go. And uh, I love that experience of having no plan, no idea where it's going to go, what it's going to sound like. And uh, so now I've kind of brought that into my painting too. And uh, so it, it feels more like this improvisation and it's very fun. And so that idea of getting it all down at once You know, and obviously they don't always work like that, the paintings, and that's part of the deal. I'm, I don't care, you know, I just, it's more the, the, the fun of the process and, uh, and the magic of the process and the things I find in the process um, kind of inspire me more than what, trying to make a beautiful picture or a great picture. I don't think like that anymore. I mean, I think more in terms of, was it a successful improv? You know, did it create an interesting color harmony? Did it, uh, I think of the color harmony as critical and almost think of it as, uh, you know, it's almost like a compositional tool, the color. Well, not almost, it is. And so, But another interesting thing has developed in that I'm not just relying on my eyes anymore. And uh, I had a pretty profound experience with Frank Auerbach, uh, not in person, but uh, from his uh, words, things he shared about painting. Uh, if you don't know, Frank Auerbach is an uh, um, English painter in England. Uh, he's been painting for a long time. I think he's in his 80s. Um, but I was visiting a friend who uh, was reading this uh, excerpt from another, from a book, um, and uh, in, the, in the excerpt he was reading, there was a quote from Auerbach, Frank Auerbach, and it just really grabbed me. I don't remember what it was, but I remember, oh, I've got to learn more about him and, and what is he about? And uh, so... Uh, this friend gave me uh, a book that had, uh, was written, some, I don't know when, I think it was written in the 90s, by a good friend of his who was a, also a, a writer, you know, and, uh, and he gave me the book and I had it sitting on my nightstand for probably several months and I didn't open it, but I, I would look at the cover a lot, <laughs> which had a picture of him. And there was just something I was drawn to about him. And uh, so this, so the book sitting there and I hadn't opened it yet. 
And this one time I'm out painting and I'm really trying to find something new in my work. And so I, instead of painting, I just got a sketch pad and I was doing uh, kind of a, um, blind contour thing with a tree. And as I was just doing that, I suddenly started having this experience of a new experience of the tree. I was feeling the tree as somehow part of me, somehow kind of like it, I was finding a sense of the tree in my body. And it was, you know, surprising and and uh, and amazing. And uh, and as as it was happening, these words came to me that said, uh, "Let your subject permeate you." And uh, so that just opened up this whole other level of tuning into a subject, not just visually, but taking it in as a, as a kinesthetic experience. Um, and it, like I said, it was, it was a game changer. It really opened something new for me. And uh, so then it was the amazing part was the next night, uh, I was uh, going to bed and I decided to open our box book for the first time and you know since I've had it for several months. And I'm reading into, I'm just reading in the uh, um, prologue. And uh, there's a quote from our box saying, you have to have your subject permeate you before you can really paint something powerful about it. And it was the same word that had occurred to me in that drawing of the tree. Um, so that was, that started this whole new thing of, uh, feeling that rapport in a, in a, like a rapport, is that the word? What is it? It's like a shared, <laughs> it's like a very intimate shared moment with your subject. Um, So now painting is not just visual for me. Just I did find it. <laughs> That's a really fascinating story. And I love that. Um, I did find one on Amazon. It's Frank Auerbach speaking and painting. That's it. Yes. Um, yeah. I think they just republished it in 2019. Huh. Um, yeah, it's got a picture of him on the front, and it's black and white. Yes. And... yes. Yeah, I would highly recommend that book. I'll post a link just in there. You know, and his work is not beautiful. You, you know, it's not like he's trying. It's it's uh, dense. It's uh, it's it's so alive. So and uh, and I guess he got to all that by this idea of having a kind of kinesthetic relationship experience of your subject. Whether whatever it is, it doesn't matter if it's the 
a cup or a plate or a, an ocean or whatever it is. I stood in front of it, sorry. And that experience, as you can imagine, was completely unexpected and I didn't even know that was possible. But throughout history, artists have described that experience um, where there was a kind of a sense of emerging and a falling in love with the subject. So, the, the, yeah, it's, it's almost like I'm beginning to appreciate a more, a little bit more of a kind of esoteric kind of experience in painting. Oh, no,
Right now I'm trying to lay in the tree trunk. Which with the knife, it's a, what's nice about it is you can actually just lay paint right on top of your, you know, your surface where there's already a bunch of paint. It's easy to just add to it. But I am still interested in the light and the getting that luminous quality. It looks different on the screen. Yeah. It's impossible to get.
I find it interesting um, watching your technique here. Um, I paint with pastel and I uh -huh. see that you're doing a similar thing with the push and the pull on the edges and, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sitting here going, oh, I need to go back to oils. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I started in pastel and uh, because, of, you know, because you mix everything right on the, I loved that about pastel. I still do some. And, uh, but then when I studied with Henry and saw how he does, it's like using pastel for his approach with the knife in that you're doing most all the mixing on the canvas. Uh, that really appealed to me and that pushed me into a knife and oil way more. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to figure out. And now I'm seeing this going, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what you can do with color. One of the probably most fascinating things to me about painting that I've been learning all along is how my perception of color keeps changing. Like, um, Henry made a statement that when I was studying with him, he said something like, your vision will always be ahead of your ability to find it in pigment. Because what we're right, what we're doing as painters is trying to translate a phenomenon of light into a phenomenon of pigment, and uh, the two behave quite differently. And uh, so that has proven to be true for me that. What he said was, you'll always be playing catch up. Your vision will always keep progressing and uh, your ability to find it in your pigments will come afterwards. And that makes sense because if we can't see something, then how are we going to know how to paint it? The nice thing, the thing I like about this kind of approach with abandon is how the, these magical things happen that were not, can't really say it was intentional. It was just the way my hand happened to move on the canvas with a certain color and a quantity of paint and just something in the texture you know, just really gets magical. 
So that's part of the thrill of it for me. It's like, wow, where's this gonna go? What's this gonna look like? So we have another comment. Jill Muser okay. says, I think the heavy paint looks so spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I like about the, with a knife, you know, every stroke stays. And uh, I love that effect. And Crystal says that uh, breaking all the rules is so inspiring and freeing. She can't wait to get her oils back out. And I, I agree with her a hundred percent. I'm, I'm very inspired myself. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. You know, it's like we get, we're so conditioned to, we got to get it right, get it right. Everything we go through all our years of schooling, uh, you know, we got to do the right to get the right answer. And, and so it, it seems we all bring that into painting. And if painting were about being right, just think how much great art would never have happened. You know, it's, it's what makes a great painting is not that it's right, but that um, it's alive. You know, our subjects are filled with life. And, uh, you know, if we can capture that sense of aliveness, then we're really, I think, onto something, onto something powerful. You know, it's like, okay, the painting didn't work. Well, so what? I had a great time doing it, and, you know, I'll do another one. Rather than try to just keep working it and chase it, you know. I mean, I do that. I'll rework a painting sometimes in the studio. But it's not because I'm unhappy with it. It's just I'm still, still kind of challenged by it and trying to find something more alive in it. And we have another question from uh -huh. Susan Steven. She's Hi, Susan. <laughs> Hi, Susan. Um, have you ever used water-soluble oils? You know, I just did for the first time. And uh, 
they kind of stink. Do you, does anybody use them? Do you notice that? They have a funny smell. And uh, I didn't care for that smell. Crystal agrees they smell foul. <laughs> yeah, kind of like a moldy smell. Ugh. Yeah, so uh, I'll probably still, you know, use up the paints I bought, but I don't think I'll be switching to it. Jan also commented that they ruin brushes. Oh, is that right? <laughs> well, that's a good reason not to use them. So I'm just going to give you a time check in. It is 7 okay. 20. Okay, and so, we're... so that's about an one hour mark that you've been painting. So just okay. wanted to let you know. <laughs> I'll wrap it up. Oh. <laughs> We have a, another um, comment from Tim King. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, I like it when you step in and out of frame and your camera places your painting briefly out of focus. Mm -hmm. It's another interesting way to see your creation. <laughs> ah, cool. <laughs> I wish I could see that. Uh, we're recording it. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, that's right. All right, and another question from Crystal. Um, how long would you say you normally spend on a painting? She understands that it varies, but ballpark. Uh, uh, lately, about an hour and a half. Well, that depends on the size, of course. If it's uh, something this size, what I'm doing today is a uh, 12 by 16, and I'll probably usually spend about uh hour to an hour and a half and then you know if it does if it's like if it's working but it didn't quite get to a completion a sense of completion for me i'll go back and uh, work some more on it a second time and i'll just go back 
you know, uh, looking for the same lighting conditions. Uh, so if I go back, if I go back, it's the same time of day. And it's if it's the same kind of day. You know, sunny, uh, like if it's like a sunny morning from 9 to 10.30. And uh, so I'll go back that next day if it's sunny and uh, take another shot at it. So I'll stop here. And uh, I'm going to take the camera. Yeah, wow. That's beautiful. And that's the contrast is not as big in the actual painting. Here's my palette. <laughs> is that a glass palette? Yeah. Yeah. And, Easiest uh, to clean. <laughs> yeah, they're great. So that's that. And uh, so now let me switch to this. Uh, yeah, I can remove and, your spotlight. Uh, yeah. Um, and then if see. there's any more questions, I'm happy to try and answer that. Here. Yes. So if anyone has a question, um, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask, this is your chance. <laughs> okay, my, well. My question to you is, is are you currently accepting more students? <laughs> uh, I have not been teaching in person, but I do uh, have, um, you know, I have, I have an ongoing class on Monday afternoons in my studio. It's been going on for 25 years. And, um, but since COVID started, we switched to, um, what are we on now? Zoom. Zoom, Zoom. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I do teach it still through on Zoom and, uh, there are still a few openings. If anyone is interested, you can. Uh, oh, and then, um, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm starting an online class through the Arvada Center on landscape painting from photos. Uh, and it starts next week. So if that's interesting, you can sign up for that. That's the, the Arvetta uh, Center of for Arts. The arts and for the arts. Yeah. Um, and then there's another class I start next week there as well, but also on Zoom called Drawing as Meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, I want to explore this thing that opened up with uh, that idea of being permeated by the subject. And so I'm going to lead a group to see if we can have some deeper uh, experience of that, that kind of kinesthetic connection to the subject. A, a question? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was just wondering, I, I, I noticed that you um, took a photo that was kind of stark in terms of the contrast between the cool light of being in shade versus the warm uh, view with the sun on it. Uh, 
And so, but with your painting, you made that path, you warmed it up. It went from being kind of a cool gray purple in the photo to being a nicely sort of pinkish brown. And then the horizon, uh, as the sky met the sea, um, you warmed that up too. You And I know natural light can be sort of chilly, but you took a, a kind of the camera portrayed it as white and you warmed it up with a bit of yellow. Did you know, uh, from your experience that this would be a good idea unifying the painting by minimizing some of the starkness of the cool and warm light or what any thoughts on why you made those color choices yeah that's a really that's good question and uh and yes you know i've been painting from life painting landscape out in nature for you know quite a few years now and i've uh learned how a camera doesn't capture what my eyes see. I mean, you probably have had that experience where you're, you're out hiking and you see this gorgeous scene and you take a picture of it and, and then you get back home and open it up and it's, 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 it's kind of dead compared to what, uh, what you remembered from your visual experience. And so, yeah, what I find is the camera does tend to overall cool the the color and it also tends to make the shade planes darker and the light planes lighter so it alters the value aspect of the colors too so when i work from a photograph i'm you know painting more from my experience than from what the photo is showing me although it's you know there's still a lot of useful information but I still, yeah, I would say I much prefer to work from life than a photo Makes because sense. of that very, very thing. Yeah, how it Thank alters you. the whole thing. Sure. Um, I found your class and I at the Arvada Center, and so I stuck uh -huh. the link to that in the chat for anyone who's interested. Great. Well. Um, <clears throat> What else? Um, so Valerie St. Marie um, <laughs> really appreciated that we did this via Zoom. And she usually works in watercolor, but this is great and thought provoking information. Great. Yay. Um, Does it read a little different? The painting seems like it reads a little different from my computer monitor than it did from the phone. Yeah, your um, computer monitor kind of cooled everything down. Oh, is that bit. what it did? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but it's 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 beautiful. You know, just the the values and the the color play. Um, you know, you really caught that ocean atmosphere because <laughs> there's uh -huh. always seems to be so much moisture in the air down at the beach right. yeah, and yeah. Uh, I grew up in Santa Cruz so I oh, nice. <laughs> I recognize the sky what are you like... doing here <laughs> <laughs> right I know <laughs> could we see the painting one more time yeah um let's see if I should uh let me unpin you and get you back here. Yeah, it is warmer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, on the phone, it seems warmer and more, it exaggerates the contrast quite a bit. The ground note notes and the shadow planes of the trees aren't as dark there. Let's just... Sorry about that. Let me get you back here. Can you pin that one for a second? The yep. computer. There we one? go. Yep. Is it pinned? I think so. Weird, kind of, um, hmm. Yeah, I think it's 
Let me uh, try one more time. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely um, cools it down and it, it it doesn't make the darks as dark. Yeah, now it's, now it's the other way. <laughs> it's yeah. way more saturated. And, Could be uh, the light too, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Your computer monitor is probably making it look blue too. <laughs> oh, right, because it's that close to it. Yeah. So. Well, you know what? If you really want to see it, come to the studio and I'll oh, show it to you. We'll be right over. <laughs> okay, come on over. <clears throat> now, this is great. Thank you so much. And honestly, everyone's very excited in the chat. They're saying thank you. They really appreciated great. your insights and beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful painting. Great. Thank you. Well, it was fun and I hope it was somehow useful or at least entertaining it's and, very inspirational uh, <laughs> good yay i like hearing that well thank you for the opportunity to throw paint on a board in front of a bunch of people <laughs> that's always fun yeah and thank you so much for for taking time and sharing this with us tonight and we really mm. appreciate it yeah my pleasure you're welcome all right. Okay. All right. Well, everyone, have a wonderful evening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next month. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Nice. I can just imagine if everybody's coming. Come on screen if you can and say goodbye.